Okay, everyone, let's get started. Um, seeing that we have a quorum, I hereby call uh, today's meeting of the Bloomington Common Council, Wednesday, June the 16th, beginning at 6.30, um, 2021. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Rallo? Here. Rosenbarger? Here. Scambaluri? Here. Sims? Here. Clarity? Here. Smith? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it is my understanding that both um, Council Member Bolin and Council Member Piedmont Smith will not be joining us this evening. And Council Member Sandberg, as I understand it, is um, finishing up some personal business and will be joining us um, soon, I believe. Okay, tonight's agenda summation, um, like many of our meetings, um, oftentimes this year and more often than not, we have a pretty full agenda this evening. First, we will have the approval of minutes uh, for May 27, 2020 and July 29th of 2020. Then we'll move down to reports, uh, which a maximum of 20 minutes is set aside for each, porch, each part of this section uh, will be council members, the mayor and city offices, including the innovation report, council committees, and then public comment. Then we'll move to any appointments to boards and commissions, if we have any. Then we'll move to legislation for second readings and resolutions. Resolutions 21-19, authorizing the allocation of the Jack Hopkins Social Services Program funds for the year 2021 and related matters. Then we'll move to resolution 21-21 to confirm resolution 21-20, designating an economic revitalization area, approving the statement of benefits and authorizing an abatement period for real property improvements regarding property at 1730 South Walnut Street uh, called the Retreat at Switchyard. Um, petitioner Real America LLC, Retreat at Switchyard LP Petitioner. Then we'll move to resolution 21-22, which is re a resolution proposing to opt out of the opioid settlement pursuant to Indiana Code 4-6-15-2. Uh, then we have resolution 21-23, recognizing the 52nd anniversary of the Stonewall riots and the June celebration of Pride Month. Then we'll continue on with ordinance 21-30 to amend title 16 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Residential Rental Unit and Lodging Establishment Inspection Program. Then we'll move to ordinance 21-25 to establish the American Rescue Plan Act Fund, the ARPA Fund, supporting the city of Bloomington's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll move to ordinance 21-28 and ordinance to amend ordinance-23, which fix salaries for certain city of Bloomington employees for the year 2021 regarding to change the grade of existing positions in the office of the mayor, the parks department, the utilities department, and revised job titles within both the police and fire departments to better reflect the nature of those positions. And finally, we'll have ordinance 21-29, amending ordinance 20-22, which fixed the salaries of officers of the police and fire departments for the city of Bloomington for 2021 regarding title change for fire inspector. There are no legislation for first readings this evening. We will then move to additional public comment, if any. We'll review matters of council schedule, and then we will adjourn for the evening. Um, actually, we'll adjourn for the council recess, um, and we will readjourn, <laughs> reconvene July 21st, 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, I believe we have minutes for approval. Council Member Clarity. Yes, Mr. President, I move that the minutes from the May 27th, 2020 special session and the July 29th, 2020 regular session be approved. Second. Thank you, it's been properly moved and seconded that uh, these minutes be approved. Will the 
clerk, please call the roll. Yes, Council Member Rallo. Yes. Rosenbarger. Yes. Scambolari. Yes. Sims. Yes. Clarity. Yes. Smith. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That passes six zero. We will now move to reports. Um, First, we'll start with council members. Um, beginning with, as I see you on the screen to my left, uh, council member Smith. No report, thank you, President Sims. Thank you. Council member Scambolari. No report this evening, thank you. Thank you. Council member Flaherty. No report, thank you. Thank you. Council member Rallo. No report. Thank you. Council member Rosenbarger. No report, thank you. Thank you. Bringing up the rear, I do have a brief report that I'd like to give. Um, I wish to, or I would like to wish everyone that's um, in attendance this evening, um, I'd like to wish you all a happy Freedom Day, Jubilee Day, or, and or Liberation Day. Now those are names that's also known as what we call Juneteenth. Um, that actual date is June the 19th, which, which will be this Saturday. And June the 19th, or Juneteenth as we call it, marks the day when the federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas in 1865 to take control of the state and ensure that all slaves uh, were to be freed. The troops arrival came to Texas a full two and a half years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation which was signed by President Lincoln on September 22nd of 1862, which was to take effect on January 1st of 1863. Um, this again is a celebration of emancipation and liberation. Um, and a lot of people celebrate, particularly those um, in the African-American and black communities across our nation. Uh, many states are now adopting it um, as uh, state holidays, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, it will become a federal holiday or is in the works to become a federal holiday. And many cities and towns have adopted that celebration um, to recognize that day. So um, again, happy Juneteenth to you all. Happy Freedom Day, happy Jubilee Day and happy Liberation Day. Thank you very, very much. Now we'll go to reports from the mayor and the city offices. I do believe we have innovation report this evening. And Ms. Kidd, will you be presenting? I believe the mayor will be talking first. Thank you, Mayor Hamilton. Or perhaps I will go. <laughs> uh, perhaps. Thank you. Okay. No problem. I'm going to get set up. Okay. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Confirmed. Yes. Okay. Great. Well, Good evening, everyone. My name is Dave Takid and I'm the Director of Innovation. I wanna thank council and the mayor for the opportunity to update you on the work of the Office of Innovation um, over the last two years. It's been that long since I've had an opportunity to speak to council about this work. Earlier today, um, I provided council with a memo about the work of this office, lots and lots of details. Tonight, I'm going to be presenting just some of the highlights, but I'm always open to meeting with you and having more discussion about this work that I love. Apologize for this pop-up on my screen. Just a little bit of context. Um, in the first year of this mayor's first administration, there was an innovation task force that was established and 
the task force comprised of was comprised of members of our community, community leaders, and also some city of Bloomington employees. And they looked at how could the city be more nimble and adapt to a rapidly changing environment. And the task force came up with a number of different recommendations. 11 of them are listed here on the screen and seven of them were immediately adopted and completed and three of the remaining four are under consideration. One of those recommendations was to establish the Director of Innovation role. Tom Miller served in this role until 2018 and I came on board in 2019. Nationally, the need for a role dedicated to innovation is only increasing. Bloomberg Philanthropies, which is an organization that's dedicated to supporting and encouraging the establishment of a director of innovation role in local governments, um, reported that in 2012, there were only five such people in this role in the United States. And less than a decade later, we've got over 80 in this role. Um, we're honored to be among those cities who were included in the 80. And some of the other participating cities are ones that we benchmark against pretty regularly, like Chattanooga, Tennessee, or Austin, Texas, or Boulder, Colorado, and even Indianapolis has a chief innovation officer that's um, together with their performance management group. In addition to establishing this role of chief innovation officer, more and more um, additional staff is being supplied to the offices of innovation. And they're also staffing them uh, with people who have skills in data analytics and in uh, performance analysis and performance improvement. Just one minute, there we go. When I came on board in 2019, uh, the mayor, deputy mayor, and I came together to define the scope of the Office of Innovation, and we identified these needs. First, increase organization effectiveness by looking at our internal processes, seeing where we can streamline things, eliminate duplication between departments, and in some cases, make them digital. Secondly was nurturing a culture of innovation. We wanted to ensure that everyone in the organization understands what we mean by innovation and they feel empowered to improve their processes regardless of their role or their title within the organization. And then finally preparing the organization for the future. There are a couple of things that we know that are coming down the pike like climate variability and automation, just to name a few, and we wanna start thinking about their impact now. When I talk with people about innovation, this is what they normally think about. Robots and drone taxis and chip implants. And yeah, all of those things are animation, uh, innovation, but if that's all it was, then for most of our 750 plus employees, they wouldn't have a space to be able to participate in innovation. So what we wanna do is define innovation in a way that every employee at the city understands that it's something that they can do and it looks more like this. Innovation can be about scrappy inventions about engaging with other departments and residents to question and even reimagine some of our long-standing services and to partner with research startups and get us information for decision-making faster. One of the innovations that I'd like to lead with tonight is if you've been on Kirkwood recently, you've seen the, the posts that lift out of the ground so that we can close off some sections of the road and have a bicycle and pedestrian friendly area for events. These posts are called bollards and they have a cement filling that lifts out of the ground and this heavy metal casing that slides on top of them. 
putting the bollards in place and taking them down is awkward and it's pretty much a, a back injury waiting to happen. The bollards came to us with two small tools that required staff to get down on the ground and use and that put, as you can imagine, even more strain on their backs. So Michael Large, who many of you know as the Special Projects Manager in Public Works, saw that danger to the employees' backs and asked Fleet Division Director Jason Spear if his staff could fabricate something better. So they observed the process, very important. They interviewed the laborers doing the work and they made new, longer tool using part of the original tools that was supplied. The new tool allows the cement filling to be lifted or placed using arm muscles instead of their vulnerable back muscles. And while those fleet um, employees were there, the laborers who were doing the work of the bollards came to them and said, we've got another problem. They struggled to lift those heavy casings, the yellow casings off of the rack and walk them to their location and then hoist them up on top of that filler. So they went through the same process again. They observed what they were doing, they interviewed them about it, and then they crafted something. And the solution devised by those fleet workers was a handle that slides on top of the casings and then grips it at an angle so that a team of two then can now safely, easily, and quickly lift and carry the bollard casings to their destination. Um, I wanna thank uh, Frank and Ryan for their craft and both Michael and Jason for their leadership. Michael Large called this effort to my attention to make sure that the good work of this group was documented and recognized so that other people who self-identify as natural engineers in the organization could be inspired. And that is how culture is built. We recognize and celebrate the behaviors that we want to see more of. And a fun fact, the City of Bloomington Legal Counsel, Philippa Guthrie, is researching whether or not Frank and Ryan's tools can actually be patented. Another project that some of you are very familiar with is the leaf management or uh, leaf service transformation project. When the 2019 budget was being prepared, the city council inquired about the cost of the vacuum truck leaf collection program. You can see that in the animated GIF here. In addition to having a high financial cost, the service is also really labor intensive and also very carbon intensive. And residents who were interviewed about the service also said that the service often comes too early before the leaves have fallen, or it comes too late in the season when the leaves are already frozen in place. And in the meantime, leaves raked to the property edge, but not yet collected by the vacuum truck are blowing into the streets onto sidewalks where they get really slippery and dangerous and also going to, into our storm drains, which causes flooding and eventually mold. I, um, in 2020, I led a group of 11 employees from nine different departments in innovation training and also what we call action research to explore alternate ways of managing our leaves. This team spent their pandemic brainstorming, testing different ways to keep our leaves out of the streets and out of the drains and off sidewalks, and also to give residents more power over when their leaves are managed and reduce the financial and environmental impact. The option they piloted with 22 households was to mulch and compost as many of the leaves as possible and put the remainder in yard waste bags for pickup on their regularly scheduled waste days. So it's a very predictable schedule. They have full control over this. While the pilot was largely successful, it didn't give us enough information 
for us to know whether it's a good idea to spread this to the entire city. So in 2021, we launched 1,000 Households Who Mulch, which is an expansion of the 2020 pilot with a couple of tweaks. To register to be part of this expanded pilot, you can go to tinyurl.com slash 21-leaf-challenge. And if you're an experienced mulcher and composter, you can register for that as well and help others learn how to mulch and compost at that tinyurl.com slash 21-yard-leader. Both of those links are also on that project page, which tells the story of the 21, 2021 effort and also links back to the 2020 effort that uh, started it. A really exciting new development in this project is that we're partnering with Earth Keepers Compost. They're offering two incentives to participate. First of all, if you sign up and register just to participate in the challenge, then Earth Keepers is giving you half off of their subscription service, which brings the monthly cost down to six bucks. And that would be for the duration of the challenge, which is September through December. And secondly, if your neighborhood is one of the top two neighborhoods in terms of volume of participants, you'll have the opportunity to locate an Earth Keepers kitchen compost drop-off enclosure right in your neighborhood, if you like. So I encourage you to register today if you haven't already. And the last example of innovation that I wanna give you is um, something, uh, again, that happened during the pandemic. The company 120 Water stated that scientists believe we start shedding that coronavirus RNA up to five days before the average symptom onset. And most folks don't get tested until they have symptoms, which can be between one and two weeks after they've been exposed. And then they have to wait for results. The city of Bloomington Utilities, or CBU, realized that they could capture that RNA that was being sloughed into the wastewater before someone has symptoms. That means that they could know about a potential outbreak one, maybe even two weeks ahead of when those folks would get tested. The potential for this advance warning would be enough time to alert the city, the county, and IU Health of a potential bloom that could result in an uptick in hospitalizations or warrant a quarantine warning. CBU partnered with the company 120 Water to collect samples and also partnered with Indiana Finance Authority to fund the analysis of the samples, which is not cheap. CBU's engineering department also used the data collected to create an interactive map for the project, which helped them communicate out those results better. So innovation at the city of Bloomington can be the creation of a tool or modifying an existing tool um, it could be questioning whether the way that we've always done things meets the needs of the day, or it could be using an existing capability like our wastewater analysis for a new purpose. You can find details of all of these stories and more at our Innovation Success Stories page at the video of our second annual innovation celebration. And don't forget, to check out the 1,000 Households Who Mulch project page and sign up now to get an Earth Keepers compost discount. City of Bloomington employees have always been innovative, way before we had a director of innovation role. But their creativity, the results of their creativity were happening in pockets and it wasn't being shared throughout the organization. Through our success stories documentation, our innovation celebrations, and our innovation training groups were sending the message that not only can anyone in the organization innovate, we want you to. Moving forward, I'll continue coaching the graduates of the first training group and leading their own projects, big and small, and use our training experience to create a City of Bloomington specific innovation toolkit that can be used to scale up their learning. Additionally, we plan to train more department directors so they can be better coaches to their employees in this area, as well as launching our second training cohort for which we are still um, searching for a project topic. 
I've had the pleasure of attending some of your constituent meetings over the past couple of years. I'm always available for listening sessions to hear what your constituents say is most important to them. Or I'm happy just to talk about innovation in general. I can be reached at the email that's listed here and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Okay, thank you for that report, Ms. Kidd. Um, before we go to questions, I understand that Mr. Crowley would have a few or has some comments under this section um, of city officers reports. But before we do that, I'd like to go to um, um, councils for any questions for Ms. Kidd and the innovation report. Council Member Robin. Not so much a question, but uh, thank you, Ms. Kidd. I was uh, very uh, enthused about the composting. It's been suggested for, gosh, about 15 years now. And so I'm, I'm glad we're moving head on. And I, I, I wonder if this could dovetail uh, with our goal to reduce uh, the some 40% of organic materials within our waste stream. And, you know, it, it's kind of, it's complimentary if we were to distribute composters to anybody who would like them, you know, nothing fancy, just uh, stationary backyard composters that are sealed. Uh, you know, leaf material is good for intermixing with uh, uh, kitchen waste because kitchen waste is high nitrogen and you need carbon. And so the, the leaves are just ideal for that. So, you know, it, you, you may have already been working on that or something, but I think that, you know, that meets both of our goals, right? Is not yeah. only to, um, you know, prevent the, what, what is seemingly a kind of a, in, in many ways, a, 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 a absurd endeavor of picking up leaves um, when they could stay on site and compost. And then we could also, you know, inform the public about how to put their uh, compost to use in terms of their kitchen waste. So just, just wanted to mention that. You're probably already thinking about that, but uh, just, you know, wonder, wonder about your comments regarding it. Yes, thank you. I think that's why it's so important to have Andrea and Ryan from Earth Keepers as partners in this project. And of course, they've got a business interest in this. However, they're also adjunct members of our steering committee who's working on this project with us. And they're helping us create the training and education materials for um, that are really necessary. A, a big barrier that we found in the 2020 pilot was that there were some people that the uh, knowledge of how to compost or how to mulch was too high of a barrier for them to participate in the pilot. So as part of the 2021 project, we're flooding education and training resources and um, understanding how to deliver those to people. And, one, and once they know, and if they've got uh, the space to be able to do so, then they can compost their kitchen waste in their own backyard. If they don't want to do that, if there's a fear of uh, rodent infestation, if, they're, um, if they just don't have the space, then they have, we're, we're really lucky to have this opportunity within our community that there's a business that's willing to, to take that as well. So yeah, we're, we're absolutely looking into that. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions from or comments from council members? <laughs> council member Scambellari. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kidd, for the report. I appreciate it. Um, I was struck by what you said that in we went from um, five innovation directors in 2012 to 80 plus these days. Um, and thank you for sharing that some of those cities are our aspirational peers, shall we say. Um, how do those cities, is there anything you could share about how those cities evaluate the success of their programs and the investment of money that they make in those positions? I remember you talking about this the last time that I, I presented and- I am uh, predictable, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the, I, you know, I really resonate with um, the, the goal of having performance measures and through Bloomberg Philanthropies, who we are 
they're a really strong partner of ours. I connect with a lot of those cities and we all really struggle with how do we quantify how um, specifically the role of director of innovation. So if you removed that role, what what would you see? And if you insert that role, then, then what is the difference? And um, at, at City of Bloomington, we haven't fully quantified it yet. I think it's an ongoing discussion and I definitely welcome your thoughts into if I could see this kind of impact, then I would know for sure that it definitely makes sense to for us to not only have a director of innovation, but maybe even contribute staff or additional skills to it. Um, but what we are seeing is that there's, um, we're, we're documenting an understanding of when innovation is happening, what is present in terms of the culture of that department or division, the kind of leadership style they have, the resources that they dedicate to it. And um, we are, supplying the training and eventually a toolkit to help make that happen more often so that it's not in pockets and it's not by accident, but that it's intentional. Um, but yeah, please, if you have thoughts about how to, how to quantify that, it's a, it's a topic that comes up, I would say once a quarter in my network through Bloomberg philanthropies of, well, you know, how do, how do we describe this? It's, it's, um, it's a difficult thing for us to, to get our arms around. I appreciate your kind of wrestling with that with me. So thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Um, any further questions or comments from council members? Let me switch screen so I don't miss anyone. Okay. Thank you, seeing none. Thank you for your report, Ms. Kidd. Thank you. I'll now invite Mr. Alex Crowley. Um, to give part of his uh, report as, from the city offices. Um, Mr. Crowley, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me okay? I can. I just can't see you. Um, I will remind you, though, that um, of this section, we have about four and a half minutes left. So please okay. proceed. Thank you. Good evening, council members. I'm Alex Crowley, Director of Economic Sustainable Development. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to speak this evening. It's with a somewhat heavy heart that I'm here this evening to share with you that Sean Starwitz, the city's assistant director for the arts, will be leaving the city in mid-July to pursue graduate studies in Philadelphia. We're thrilled for Sean, even if we're sad to lose him. He'll most certainly make significant contributions to his future communities. And I wanted to use this brief opportunity to share with you some highlights of his contributions to Bloomington and the surrounding region in his five plus years with the city. While a lot of Sean's work is visible around the city in the form of tangible art pieces he's helped to facilitate, including murals and public art installations, his most significant work, in fact, may be intangible. First and foremost, in my mind, is the deliberate strategy Sean implemented to signal permission and agency to community groups, artists, and makers that they should feel empowered to make things happen themselves in the community whether in the form of community painted traffic calming murals or the development of new festivals like Blackie Brown, Sean encouraged artists to consider Bloomington as their city and provided them the organizational support and guidance they needed to succeed. While this seems just part of uh, the job, it actually takes a soft touch to help guide someone else's outcome. And Sean managed this masterfully in his time as Bloomington. Sean was also a great communicator and connector uh, with groups and of groups with each other. Uh, individuals with groups, artists with funding, a true community organizer of artists. This was especially true during the COVID pandemic, a time when the arts community was as isolated as we all were and arguably more so. Whether this connection took the form of uh, searching out matching local artists with local fabricators to help them participate in our public art efforts or curating the, your, uh, the Bloomington Arts Commission to drive engagement and a new generation of ideas. Sean has been an expert in arts ecosystem development, an effort that will pay dividends to Bloomington for many years to come. Not the least of Sean's successes was, was to draw attention to and increase the funding role in the city and council 
um, and, and the role that they play in supporting artists and the many fabulous cultural organizations um, that uh, we have in Bloomington. Whether advocating for and gaining your approval for doubling the, the Bloomington Arts Commission grants uh, program, and thank you to the mayor and the council for your support of that increase, or helping to streamline and implement the BUEA arts program, or working tirelessly during the pandemic to secure and accelerate additional crisis support funding. Sean's quiet persistence in delivering funding helped the arts community survive in one of its most turbulent moments. Sean was also driven by expanding participation in public art among new artists. An example of this is Esteban Garcia, the artist who will deliver a remarkable piece at the Trades District Garage. By encouraging artists to apply for work, biasing new artists to give them a leg up and create diversity in the public art realm, and then working diligently to help them overcome financial and other barriers as they undertook their first public art efforts. Sean has helped new artists access commissions that will and already have allowed them to participate in this important aspect of their career development. I could go on and on. You'll see public art coming out uh, for the, from the 1% of the arts program and many other um, outcomes of Sean's work. And I, let me just finish by saying, we've been extraordinarily fortunate to have Sean Starowitz as a colleague in our small but mighty ESD department, as a city colleague, and as a champion of our amazing arts community. Beyond being a highly effective assistant director of the arts, Sean was also a thoughtful, supportive colleague who pushed us all, especially with issues of race, equity, and inclusion, and made us all better. So we wish him well as he prepares to take Philadelphia by storm. Please join me in thanking him on behalf of the wider Bloomington community. Thanks. Thank you. We're all applauding. Um, I see Sean is on the screen and if it's okay and Sean, if you like, um, I think we can spare about 30 seconds or so if you'd like to give us a word or two. Uh, sure. Uh, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was a very sweet uh, presentation. I mean, how does one measure um, labor and time, right? Especially in this public sector and especially over the five years of, of, that I've been here since 2016. Uh, a lot has changed in the community. A lot will continue to change, but it's been an as absolute uh, uh, privilege and honor to uh, serve on the behalf of all 84,000, uh, you know, citizens and community members in Bloomington to think about the arts and culture. And I, I just want to say to the council, it's been a pleasure to work with you all. And um, you, this, this community really believes in the power of the arts and culture sector. And that's really, really important. I mean, the fact that this position exists at a town our size, it's unprecedented in a lot of ways. Um, and we are, continue to be a thought leader in the state and in the region. And I think that will still continue to be the case. Um, and yeah, I, I will, it's, it's very bittersweet to be here. I was not expecting to say anything, but um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, I, you know, I'm looking forward to keeping in touch, obviously my family's close by. Um, so it's all a little bit bittersweet. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Sarwich. Um, and if I may, I'll take the opportunity and I believe I could speak on behalf of my colleagues. We want to thank you for your service to ESD um, and the arts community and in the culture landscape. Um, and personally, I just, I wish you luck. I think we all do. But I just want to thank you for what you've done in the community with as far as inclusiveness and building community. Um, things that may seem as small as just painting traffic calming devices um, on the west side of town or um, the hard work you do in the Blackie Brown Festival and, and bringing people together. And I think um, that's invaluable and you're leaving some pretty big shoes to fill, but we are very, very appreciative of your service and good luck. Hope to hear good things from you in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll now move to um, reports for any council committees. Okay, seeing none, we'll now go to public comment. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that members of the public may speak on matters of community concern not listed on the agenda at one of the two public comment opportunities. Citizens may speak at one of these periods, but not both. Speakers are allowed five minutes. 
this time allotment may be reduced by the presiding officer if numerous people wish to speak. So um, everyone who wishes to speak during this portion of public comment, could you please indicate by using the raise hand function in Zoom or sending the meeting posts a note in chat? Um, what we'd like to do is, is properly divide the 20 minutes if necessary so that everyone has a chance to speak. I will also remind the public that any and all comments that are sent to our council office staff, um, and that's either emails, phone calls, et cetera, they're all compiled and forwarded to every council member. Um, so there is another opportunity um, to be heard. Um, now, Mr. Lucas, uh, how many hands do you, I just see three. I see three raised hands at the moment, and I have a request that came in over chat to uh, to speak. So I see four four folks wanting to uh, comment. Um, okay, can we do the chat first and take it from there? Yes, it's not a written comment. It's just someone letting me know that they'd like to speak uh, via chat. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm happy to call on that individual first. Uh, that's Andrew Gunther. And uh, Mr. Gunther should be able to unmute. Okay, but before we do that, okay, so it's just the four people that we have that are indicating they wish to speak? That's what I see at the moment, yes. yes. Okay, um, then we will allow five minutes to start. Thank you, Mr. Gunther. Thank you to the council for the opportunity to give comment this evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Gunther and I will keep this relatively brief. I'm currently engaged in a lawsuit against the city of Bloomington regarding the city's interpretation of Indiana Code 36-1-8-10, which grants authority to political party chairs to appoint members to statutory boards under certain conditions. I'm here to bring to attention an additional potential legal issue for the city. I've recently noticed that the city is permitting members of city boards and commissions to continue serving for up to 90 days after the term expires in order to give the granting the appointing authority, such as the council and the mayor, time to find appointees. I've been told the reasoning for this is the city's interpretation of Indiana Code 36-1-8-10. If I am not mistaken, there is no basis to believe that this section of Indiana Code, nor any section of Indiana Code or Bloomington Municipal Code, allows the city to do what they are doing. Under Indiana Code 36-1-8-10, an expired member serving for 90 more days is allowed, but only for boards and commissions that are split based on political affiliation. These boards and commissions in Bloomington include the Planning Commission, the Public Transit Board, the Board of Park Commissioners, and the Bloomington Urban Enterprise Association. No other boards or commissions in Bloomington are governed by political party affiliation requirements. Thus, all other boards and commissions are not eligible to utilize the 90-day vacancy allowance per my understanding of the law, which I'm intimately familiar with and have legal counsel for. What can the city do to do this? Easy. The city council can pass a resolution amending Bloomington Municipal Code regarding boards and commissions to allow for all boards and commissions in Bloomington to allow for 90 days after the expiration of the term for an appointing authority to find an appointee. During that time, the previous appointee can continue to serve in order to continue the business of the commission unimpeded. Until that point, however, I am of the opinion that the city should not be allowing members of municipal boards and commissions with expired terms to continue to serve past their term end date, which are established by municipal code section 2.12 boards, commissions, and councils. The council could easily amend municipal code section 2.02.030 appointments slash time limit before making to be appointments slash time constraints and add in the 90 day window. Otherwise, the city is in violation of municipal code section 2.12 boards, commissions, and councils. And I'm of the opinion that the city should follow their own rules, especially those that govern the decision-making and advisory bodies in our local government. The council should lead by example and make these amendments a priority for their future agendas. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak and I yield my time. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Gunther. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next up is Mary Morgan. Good evening, Council. Um, I'm Mary Morgan, Director of Advocacy and Public Policy for the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. Um, the City of Bloomington has helped create a vibrant community by investing millions of, our, of dollars into our downtown, into Switchyard Park, 
and the Beeline Trail. I'm here tonight to draw attention to a situation that's damaging the city's investment and endangering the economic health of the community that we all cherish. I'm sure you've read recent reports about vandalism downtown. And while those incidents have received some attention, there's a significant amount of other negative activity that's affecting our community and that isn't being addressed. Over the past few weeks, the chamber has received an increased number of calls and emails from businesses that are experiencing vandalism, theft, and aggressive panhandling. Their empl employees and customers are being harassed by people who are acting out. Businesses are dealing with people defecating and urinating on their property. Employees have to pick up needles and clean up trash on a daily basis. These incidents are increasing and they seem to be concentrated along Kirkwood um, and South Walnut, the Beeline Trail and Switchyard Park area. This could even impact the ability of the city to find tenants for the retail space in the 4th Street parking garage. And although the incidents that we know of are primarily located in districts that are represented by council members, Isabel Piedmont Smith and Steve Volan, the issue should concern every council member, the mayor and anyone really who cares about the well-being of all members of our community, as well as Bloomington's economic health. You're hearing from me about this issue and not from the individual business owners or nonprofits because they fear backlash if they speak out. They are already dealing with the impact of the pandemic, a labor shortage and additional expenses for security and cleanup. They are bearing the brunt of the situation and don't see any relief in sight and they need your help. The Bloomington Police Department has been responsive but is severely understaffed and doesn't have the resources or frankly the support of some of our city's political leaders. Even if you determine that this isn't an issue for law enforcement, please understand that we need to deal with this in some way and that addressing it requires resources and political will. It's unacceptable to do nothing. We ask you to protect the investments you've made on behalf of all residents and to help find solutions that support the community we all hold dear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Morgan, for your comments. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next is Jim Shelton. Good evening, Council. Uh, Jim Shelton. You may remember that on May 19th, I uh, expressed a concern at your meeting about annexation about the impact of annexation on the county's TIF. I'm a member of the County Redevelopment Commission. I'm not speaking officially on their behalf, but uh, I do wanna tell you that we did have a meeting today. And as Mr. Rooker promised at the May 19th meeting, the city did send representatives. They sent him and uh, Mr. Allen from legal. They sent uh, Mr. Smith and uh, Mr. Stricter from uh, Reedy Financial Group and Mr. Unger from Bose McKinney. They made a presentation. They updated us on their numbers. We were worried that the numbers weren't right. Uh, and we were concerned about the distribution of the numbers. We have four TIFs. At that time, it appeared all four were impacted in the city's uh, opinion because they showed on their map that they were gonna annex the OGE site. Well, that turns out to have been an oversight that's been corrected on uh, your website now. But we still didn't know how the uh, impact was going to be distributed across the three TIFs. They explained that. They updated the impacts, and it's uh, only about a fourth of what they showed in the report that they gave to you on the 19th, which is great news. And that's primarily because they updated it with the impact of the fire districts. Uh, I just want to uh, report that that happened. I want to thank the administration, the city, for spending so much time and sending so much firepower over to answer our questions, which they did. We identified some things that uh, make it imperative that we have these conversations much more frequently. One of the things we have uh, four TIFs. Uh, one's not impacted because it's totally cooked. One of them is Ful the Fullerton TIF. That's how we are partially funding the extension of Fullerton Pike out to the I-69 exit that's identified as Fullerton. That project is being funded uh, not by a bond. We did not take incur any debt on that TIF because it's primarily based on Monroe Hospital and we couldn't depend on that as a source of income. It could always have uh, united, united with IU Health, in which case it wouldn't pay taxes at all. As a matter of fact, uh, the assessment was dramatically increased a few years ago. So as a result, there's no debt. That means one January of 2024, 
it's the city's, but we will be in the middle of a project. That uh, ex the uh, contract that will actually do phase three will still be uh, not closed until at least the end of 24 and maybe 2025. So we agree we're gonna have to work, get together and work out a way to uh, fund and make sure these pay bills still get paid when they're coming in after the first of the year. We also, after these guys, oh, and Mr. Crowley was there, um, appreciate that. We talked about, uh, we're very interested uh, in coming up with a creating a residential TIF. This is illegal in Indiana now. Uh, we're trying to get our arms and heads around how they would work. The area where we've tentatively identified that we think we want to do this is right on the cusp of an area off of State Road 46 on the way to Ellisville that is right either just being annexed or partially being annexed. Anyhow, we resolve we need to work with the city on this. And uh, Mr. Crowley, who was there, sort of nodded his head and agreed. So I want you to know that. I want you to know that it was a very good meeting, and I really appreciate they came. I uh, wanted to make sure you were updated. And I encourage you to realize that this is going to be how the future needs to be. You're annexing pieces of this TIF. We're going to have in, our, main, our TIF and non-TIF areas are going to be intermixed. Or our, sorry, our city and county TIF areas are going to be intermixed. And so if you're going to do infrastructure projects, we really need to talk to each other. And we talked about who to talk to and how we'll do those things. So. It was a very good meeting. I very much appreciate uh, that uh, the city did send these guys out and I wanted you to know how well it went. So thank you for the opportunity to let you know. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Shelton. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next is Alex Goodlad. Hi, right, Mr. Goodlad, you have about five minutes. Hello, uh, good evening. So um, what I wanna do is kind of go off of Mary Morgan's uh, comments a little bit about that issue. It relates a little bit to what um, I want to kind of get at, which is, it, so we have this issue about, and it kind of revolves around our unhoused community. And um, I think, um, you know, uh, Mary refers to it. I mean, she refers to a issue that isn't 100% related with, um, you know, complaints of vandalism from local business. And um, I would say, you know, to an extent, there's that that's, there's validity in that concern and, and then needles in the parks as well. Um, and th there was, there was an idea that was proposed. Um, and, and I, I'm not just talking about what, um, 21, I'm not just talking about 2106, but really just the petition that um, BHC wrote in general, um, which I, I think, I mean, it, it addressed it at the time because we were working on um, a, a place for um, those people who, you know, part of why there's urinating is that there's um, no bathrooms. And um, so I, I think we need to have a, you know, a good discussion about this and we've hadn't had a good discussion so far. And uh, I guess one thing that I think would address, you know, a lot of the businesses concerns is, um, it's just to have housing for them. I, I do like the part of the rescue plan um, statement about where funds are gonna be allotted about, I, I, th I think there's a certain amount of money dedicated to, um, homelessness, we should, we should really, um, I think housing first, giving those people a place to go is going to solve a lot of those issues. And, and I hope that like the, you know, the local business communities and um, the Chamber of Commerce that's kind of echoing the complaints really tries to communicate with uh, the activists like myself rather than, um, you know, act scared of them because we try to talk. Um, and um, I feel like, you know, I, I can get angry at times, but, you know, I do try to listen. I, I believe in lending out carrots. I don't just lend out sticks. I give sticks when I feel like people are just, you know, shrugging me off. And I, I want to kind of get into this whole thing about uh, civility. Now, um, 
it, it doesn't help the discussion when on the one hand, you know, I'm kind of told to be civil and, 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 and to, for there to be complaints on my end and other people's end and the activists end about how we behave. But then, um, you know, you go on Facebook and then you see one of the council members not currently here talking about, um, uh, about how anarchists sometimes need to be put down quickly in the big picture interests of national and local security. That is what I'm quoting ver verbatim from Susan Sandberg in um, a comment that, uh, in a discussion that was later deleted. And, and I, I mention this because um, we have to really set an example um, and to not, to, to, to just like, like, like stop you know, assuming things about violence about certain demographic groups. Anarchists agree or disagree with their ideology. Um, it's, it's kind of a myth that anarchists are always violent people. And it's, it's just ridiculous that we just can't have, like on the one hand, Susan Sandberg asked for civility and and not, no character attacks, but then kind of um, writes these comments that essentially apply that, um, you know, state sanctioned violence should should happen to those people, which I wouldn't say is civil. And, um, and when we talk about wanting, um, you know, the police to deal with uh, people who, um, you know, uh, can't find a place to use the bathroom at, um, you know, that's kind of violent, too, subtly. I, I mean, in practice, that's kind of like, they don't have a place to sleep. And you got my point. So I, what, what, what I ask, also in addition to just coming up with a solution for this problem and listening to the community about solutions that we propose, is to be consistent with civility, set a good example, like, like Andrew Gunther said to do. And uh, with that, I yield my time. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Goodland. Do we have anyone else, Mr. Lucas? And while we're waiting, I'll remind anyone if they have um, or intend to make a public comment, please indicate by using the raised hand function in Zoom and or sending a notice to our meeting host of your intent to speak. I don't see any additional requests. Okay, thank you very much. Seeing none, we'll now move down to appointments to boards and commissions. Do we have any appointments this evening? Okay, Council Member Clarity. Mr. President, uh, based on the Climate Action and Resilience Committee's recommendation, I move that Matthias Banco be appointed to the Environmental Commission, C C6. Second. Thank you, it's been properly moved and second. Um, that Mr. Banco, did I pronounce that mm -hmm. correctly? Uh, be appointed. Uh, and I've already forgotten the Environmental Commission. Can you repeat right. that? Yes, the Envir Environmental Commission, uh, seat C6. Thank you. Will the clerk please call the roll, please? Yes, Council Member Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Rollo? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And that appointment is approved 7 0. Um, thank you very much, uh, Council Member Clarity. Do we have any other appointments to boards or commissions? Okay. Thank you for your patience flipping through the screens. Make sure I don't miss anyone. Seeing none, okay, we'll now uh, move further into our agenda. Uh, we do have some legislation for second reading this evening. Council Member Clarity. Uh, yes, Mr. President, a point of information first. Um, I, yes. I, I noticed the next item on the agenda is the allocation for um, authorizing the allocation for Jack Hopkins Social Service uh, Program funds. I know. Councilmember Sandberg is the chair of the committee uh, that uh, looked at that. I don't know if she was planning to uh, present or someone's already in her stead. I was going to possibly propose amending the agenda, but perhaps that's not necessary. 
do you have more information uh, to share on that I, on that I, in I, that I think it's been arranged that um uh council staff mr lucas will present if i'm not mistaken great um, since he was involved with that is that correct mr lucas well uh not exactly. Not um, exactly. Okay. See Council Member Sandberg just joining the meeting now, so she may be able to speak to this item. I, I know uh, Council Member Skimbalori uh, was also prepared to speak to this as a member of the committee. So uh, I think if either of them would like to speak to this, that would be appropriate. Okay, we'll give just a second to see if the chair um, can log on. I'd be happy to make the motion since it sounds like we're ready to move forward as well. Um, Mr. President, I move that resolution 21-19 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. And I'll second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Sorry about that. Um, yes, Council Member Scambaluri? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Dean Mount Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. And Rosenbarger? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And probably move the second. Will the clerk please read or um, Council Member Sandberg present? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry, Council Mayor Flaherty. Yes, we'll we'll need the uh, clerk to go ahead and read at this point, and then I'll I'll follow that with a motion to adopt the resolution. Thank you. Will the clerk, please read. Resol oh. Try that again. Resolution 2019, authorizing the allocation of the Jack Hopkins Social Services Program funds for the year 2021 and related matters. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution brings forward the recommendations of the 2021 Jack Hopkins Social Services Funding Program Committee. The principal task of the committee is to recommend funding for local social service agency proposals that best meet program criteria and best meet the needs of the community. This resolution allocates a total of $511,000 to 32 different agency programs. The resolution also approves the funding agreements with these agencies accepts the report of the committee and authorizes the chair of the committee to resolve any questions regarding the interpretation of the agreements. Thank you, Council Member Flaherty. I move that resolution 21-19 be adopted. And I'll second. Thank you, been properly moved and second. Council Member Sandberg, would you care to present? Thank you very much. And my apologies for joining late this evening. I'm glad I can be here because um, Jack Hopkins committee this year did an excellent job. I wanna thank all the members of that committee. In addition to those from the council, which included uh, council member Scambaluri and uh, council member Rosenbarger and council member Smith and myself, we were joined by um, Lauren uh, McAllister and Tim Mayer and um, uh, Mark, um, and I'm going up on Mark's name right now, and that is a shame. Um, really? Mark Fraley, my God, I know it off the back of my hand. Um, we came up with the recommendations that we hope you will adopt. And again, our criteria remains largely the same as Jack Hopkins always does. But this year, of course, we were still dealing with the, um, the effects of the pandemic and we were primarily uh, hoping to fund organizations that were gonna be providing the most direct service possible to our uh, low income um, uh, families um, and organizations organizations who serve those families uh, with um, a, a, what we think is a very well-rounded and uh, focused uh, set of recommendations for you. And um, I don't know if we have a screen that we could share or if it's, if it's worth our while to read through all the allocations, I would be happy to do that. Um, what's our pleasure, uh, Ms. Lacey? I do have a screen that I could share with the allocations if, if that's the... Okay, and, and I do have a copy in front of me here, so I, I, can, I can read them just from here if it's too hard to get it up. Are you able to see my screen? 
Yes, I can see that. And so we begin with All Options Pregnancy Resource Center uh, for $3,940. That is for a specific program that is a diaper distribution program. Next, Amethyst House, $21,800. That was for an upgrade of the women's residential facility. Uh, Beacon is granted $25,000, and that is rent and utility support for up to 200 households. Big Brothers, Big Sisters of South Central Indiana. Operational support for $20,000. Bloomington Community Bike Project, and that was the free bikes program, tow behind trailer, and a bike shop equipment for $6,800. Bloomington Meals on Wheels was granted $5,673 for uh, website development upgrades. Bloomington Pets Alive were given $12,500 for um, spay and neuter programming and their wellness clinic. Bloomington St. Vincent de Paul serving Monroe County uh, rental and deposit assistance for $30,000. Boys and Girls Clubs of Bloomington continuing operations post COVID-19, $24,000. Catholic Charities uh, are hiring therapists to serve adolescents and young adults, 17,800. City Church for All Nations Outreach uh, needed to purchase a moving truck, and so they were granted 6,649 and 42 cents. The Community Justice and Mediation Center were given 27,424 for their housing and eviction prevention program. Community Kitchen of Monroe County uh, needed a new cooler replacement for 5,400. Courage to Change, Sober Living are granted drug testing kits for residents, 1,036. Habitat for Humanity of Monroe County, 9,473, and that's to purchase riding mower, chipper, mulcher, and chainsaw. HealthNet Incorporated, 12,300 for a public awareness campaign. Hoosier Hills Food Bank, 35,000 for COVID food purchasing project of 2021. Hotels for Hope Incorporated, 21,500, and that's to continue housing families experiencing homelessness. Indiana Recovery Alliance, 17,000 to develop director salary support. Life Designs, 28,676.26 to pilot a day services program. Middleway House, $10,000 for a replacement work truck. Monroe County United Ministries, $22,000 for upgrade in building exterior. Mother Hubbard's Cupboard, $11,325.03 for office and pantry furniture. My Sister's Closet of Monroe County, $22,400, and that's to supplement the salary of an assistant store manager. New Hope for Families, $35,000 for uh, appliance and furnishings for uh, their new shelter. New Leaf, New Life, $12,000 for their reentry case management and direct services supplies. Uh, the Pro Bono Indiana and District 10 Pro Bono Project, 8,206 for, uh, again, their housing and eviction prevention program uh, project, which is PEP. A refugee Support Network, $8,000 for clients' rents, utility, transportation, and medical expenses. South Central Community Action Program, $2,944.22, and that's for a program making healthy choices, videos, and gardening kits. The Tandem Community Birth Center and Postpartum House, $30,000 for their birth center facilities launch. The Persisterhood Workshop was granted $2,943.07 for the purchase of professional equipment. And the Project School uh, were, uh, were granted $12,210 for installing a room in a classroom building. And again, um, we had five, uh, 11, 511,000 in order to grant, and we hit it pretty much on the target. And we're delighted that uh, uh, the, the vast majority of the organization to applied, if not given full awards for what they're, they were re requesting, they were given significant partial awards this year. And so again, with that, and with thanks to the hand department who now will be working uh, with the organizations who, um, who are granted uh, the, the, the Jack Hopkins funding for this year, uh, we want to thank them and our staff certainly for working with the committee and shepherding us through the, pro the process, which, which is rather time consuming and, and somewhat difficult in making these tough choices. So there 
there you have it and we hope for your support. Thank you, Council Member Sandberg. Um, we'll, actually there's members on the Jack Hopkins Committee and I think um, uh, it would be expeditious if they wanted something to say, we could do that in council comments, if that's okay. Um, now we'll go to council for any council questions on resolution 21-19. Council member Pete Moss Smith. Council member Pete Moss Smith. Yes, thank you. And thank you to the committee for all your hard work. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, and this is mostly for the benefit of the public, but I wanted to ask uh, about um, religious affiliation. Uh, we have a few um, applicants here on the list, uh, City Church for All Nations, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, Catholic Charities, that uh, obviously have religious names. And um, Council Member Sandberg, if you could just review for us um, uh, how the city makes sure that there's no religious test required for people to receive their assistance. Yes, there absolutely is not. Um, the services that they're providing do have to meet the criteria of the Jack Hopkins um, program, which is quite thorough about that. Uh, and so anything that's granted to them is going to direct services for the clients that they serve that are in the low income uh, uh, criteria. And that is very carefully monitored by our hand staff once the awards are granted and they are working with these organizations to make sure that they are in compliance with you know making sure those dollars are going to what it was applied for uh, so we are very comfortable the committee is very comfortable with all of the organizations of a religious affiliation that none of the jack hopkins money will go uh, for anything that and you know there's no proselytizing there's no uh, requirement for anyone to have any kind of religious affiliation in order to get the services that these organizations Organizations these these religious uh, groups provide. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any further questions from council members? Okay. And again, bear with me. I actually have I... another one, and I'm. Okay, I was going to say bear with me as I flip through the screen. My internet connection is um, bad. I don't see anyone else. Council Member Piedmont Smith, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. My inter internet connection is not very good, so uh, I'm sorry if I froze up. Um, I just wanted to ask because this is a, an organization that people may not be familiar with, but um, Council Member Sandberg, could you just review for people what the Persisterhood Workshop is and how they benefit the community? Right. This this was a unique a application, a first time ask from this particular organization. They provide uh, goods that they sell and then donate to nonprofit organizations that serve uh, individuals that meet the Jack Hopkins criteria. And so it was a relatively small ask, but they needed it in order to keep doing what they do, which we understand is a great benefit to a number of these organizations that are on this list. Uh, and um, it's kind of a, a, a an organization that just uh, uh, decided to apply to assist their work uh, and everything they do uh, goes toward um, don't, you know the uh, the, the uh, fundraising for other organizations who provide services and um, this has been a tough year as we all know for all organizations to be able to do fundraising and so we just felt that they were an important part of the network thank you very much thank you do you have any further questions from council members? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll now go to the public for public comment on resolution 21-19, authorizing allocation of Jack Hopkins social services program funds. Um, I will also remind our public that if you intend to speak, please indicate by raising or by using the raised hand function in Zoom or sending our meeting host a uh, note indicating your intent to uh, speak publicly. Mr. Lucas, do we have any takers? Yes, I see two folks at the moment. Uh, and the first was Scott Tibbs, who should be able to comment now. 
Hello, my name is Scott Tibbs. I am a resident of the first city council district and I am speaking to oppose funding for all options pregnancy resource center. The Jack Hopkins fund is supposed to be for a one-time investment according to the city's guidelines, but all options come back year after year. I wanna share some numbers with you. From their 2019 annual report, they reported $1,330,829 in income and only $761,989 in spending. Their 2020 annual report, they did have a budget deficit as many social service agencies do, but they did end the year with $703,835 in assets. Now, this is the reason I oppose them. They spent $57,507 for their abortion fund to pay for 251 abortions in the state of Indiana in 2019, which, is what, which was a 47% increase over the previous year, according to their own fiscal report. That increased the next year to $105,064, in which they paid for 414 abortions. They proudly advertised this on Facebook with the uh, image that says, let's fund some abortions. Now, providing diapers is good, but you can buy diapers for needy families without funneling that money through an organization that pays to kill babies. You could, for example, purchase diapers in partnership with the, with the township trustees or go through the hand department or other departments. So what I'm asking you to do today is to stop creating division in this community by forcing pro-life taxpayers to give money to an organization we find morally abominable. Please separate out this funding and vote it down. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Tibbs. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next is Carol Canfield. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am, we hear you fine. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you each have received an email from me voicing my objections to giving funds to All Options, an organization that supports killing children before they are born and is fighting a law that would have abortion-minded women to be counseled about how to reverse a chemical abortion. Um, as a friend of mine put it so well, we would not give the KKK tax funds for a soup kitchen, no matter how good a project that would be, but for obvious reasons, we would not give them funding. Neither should it be that funds are given to a group that supports the murder of the most fragile members of our society, the unborn. I would urge you to vote no, or at least separate out all options for its own vote. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Canfield. Um, who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next is Vox Booker. Are you there, Mr. Booker? I think he's having trouble unmuting. Hello, Ken. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the members of the Jack Hopkins Committee for their time and consideration and for funding these many important organizations in our community. Uh, I would like to take a moment to uh, say that in the matter of all options, of course, abortion is not what we're funding, uh, but I do want to adamantly say that I, I believe, as many people in our community believe, that abortion is health care and uh, it is a vital resource. Uh, and it's disingenuous and, and, and disrespectful in every way possible to hear uh, the language of a organization that, that fosters decades of hate like the KKK uh, compared to an organization that does such wonderful work in our community. And I will see the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Booker. Do we have anyone else, Mr. Lucas? No, I don't believe so. Okay, thank you. Seeing none, I will return to council for final comments on resolution 2119. 
Okay, Council Member Scambolari. Yes, thank you. Um, I had the privilege of serving as a member of the Jack Hopkins Committee, and I think I've done that a couple, three times over the years. Um, and and as my council, my, my colleague Council Member Sandberg has already done, um, just a heartfelt thank you to the social services community here for the remarkable work they do. Um, what they do to seek grants is time consuming as well. Um, yes, we have 600 pages of reading to do. Um, they do this hard work every single day and I am in awe of the social services network that we have in this town and I thank them for it. Um, I also want to acknowledge the comments of Mr. Tibbs and Ms. Canfield. Um, I haven't had a conversation with Mr. Tibbs, but I have spoken with Ms. Canfield about this. Um, I've thought a lot about this kind of funding and about how I would feel if public monies were used to support an activity of which I disapproved. I would voice my objections too, okay? So as I look at all options and in past years Planned Parenthood, one of the things I always have made it a point to do um, is to speak directly with their leadership and to ask them how their accounting processes and how their accounting practices maintain these monies as separate. So in other words, how can they ensure me uh, as someone who will vote on this that public funds from Jack Hopkins will not be commingled with funds that provide other kinds of assistance that we do wanna support like the diaper program. Um, I've read their financials, I've spoken with directors and I am satisfied that they have accounting procedures in place that keep this money separate. So I would offer that thought. Um, I also wanna express my thanks, not just to all options, but all organizations that do diaper drives. Uh, I know there are many churches that do that as well. Um, beyond just contributing to health and to just simple human dignity. Um, programs like that, I think, are among the many that seek to make abortion unnecessary or rare um, rather than just illegal. And so um, for that reason, I'll be supporting this entire package of recommendations, including all options. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member um, do you have any other comment from council members? Council Member Smith. I just want to say thank you to uh, all the organizations, all the good work, all the city staff, and and our, our chair, uh, Susan Sandberg, who just does a great job of keeping us on track and, uh, you know, uh, getting us to conclude the process in a very efficient manner. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be supporting it because it's just a great uh, opportunity to help a lot of agencies. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Council Member Smith. We've had any other final comment from council members? Okay, seeing none, are we ready for the question? Seeing no further questions from council or comment from council, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Sims. Yes. Clarity. Yes. Dean Mount Smith. Yes. Smith. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Rallo. Yes. Rosenbarger. Yes. And Scambolori. Yes. Thank you very much. Resolution 21 19 passes 8 0. We do have more legislation ready or ready for a second reading this evening. Council Member Clarity. Yes, Mr. President, I move that Resolution 21 21 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you. It's been probably moved. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Flaherty. Yes. Dean Mount Smith. Yes. Smith. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Rallo. Yes. Rosenberger. Yes. Scambolori. 
Yes. And Sims. Yes. Thank you. Get to my screen. Okay, it's been properly moved and second. Will the clerk please read? Yes, resolution 2121 to confirm resolution 2120 designating an economic revitalization area, approving the statement of benefits and authorizing an abatement period for real property improvements regarding property at 1730 South Walnut Street, retreat at Switchyard. Real America LLC, Retreat at Switchyard LP Petitioner. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution confirms resolution 20, 2120, which designated two parcels located at 1730 South Walnut Street as an economic revitalization area for Real America LLC. This designation was recommended by the Economic Development Commission on May 12, 2021, and will enable the proposed affordable housing redevelopment project to be eligible for tax abatement. The resolution affirms the approval of the petitioner's statement of benefits and it authorizes a 10 year period of abatement for real property improvements and sets the abatement schedule. Council Member Flaherty. Move that resolution 21 21 be adopted. Second. Thank you. Been properly moved to second. I do believe Mr. Crowley is here to present. Thank you, President Sims. I uh, we went into this in some depth at the last meeting, and I know you have a full meeting tonight. I would be happy to do to summarize some of this if you'd like, or or can just uh, answer any outstanding questions that may exist. I think um, a brief, as brief as you can, presentation would be in order. Okay. I don't want to so skip over things. Thank you. Sure. So why don't I do this? I will just uh, maybe extract a couple of uh, key pieces of information from the last presentation, including an overview of the development and um, and what the, what the local commitment is. Uh, and and uh, Jeff Ryan, who is with Real America, uh, perhaps can uh, complete that presentation with uh, some a summary of, of Real America and the background of the developer. So let me start with um, uh, the overview of the project. If you recall from our last discussion, this is a 64 unit, five story building with first floor real re, uh, uh, retail space, which is located, located at the former night move site at the uh, adjacent to the entrance to Switchyard Park on the east side of the park. 48 units will be reserved for low to moderate income residents and will be managed by retreat at Switchyard LP. Um, a partnership with Stone Belt to set aside 10 apartments as housing and service areas for their clients has been um, uh, settled. Real America commits to a 99 year term of affordability. 16 of the total units will be market rate. The other 48 will be uh, low and moderate income uh, housing units. And these 16 units will be managed by a, a separate entity than the 48 units. And then the commercial space is a 3,000 square foot commercial space on the northeast corner of the structure, which is facing uh, South Walnut Street. And then to reiterate what the city's proposed local commitment is, the Redevelopment Commission intends to convey the land and the structure to Real America uh, for $1. Uh, that's an approximate total value of about $975,000 based on a recent Real America appraisal. The proposed tax abatement is a 10-year abatement, starting at 100% and going down to 5% over the course of 10 years, with a gross estimated value of $154,370 and a net present value of $138,408. And just to note, the tax abatement is applicable only to uh, the 48 affordable units. In addition to those two uh, commitments, the city has also funded and provided the developer with phase one and phase two environmental assessments, which was funded by an EPA grant that the city had um, at the time. So that's the summary that I can provide. And perhaps uh, if Jeff Ryan is able to uh, jump in and wants to provide a, uh, an overview of the developer. Um, and Jeff, or I'm putting you on the spot. We didn't talk about this. So if, if you're willing to do that. No problem. Hi, I'm Jeff Ryan. I'm Vice President of Development for Real America Development, and we're very excited about coming to Bloomington with this development. Um, we've been around since uh, 19. 
1995, uh, founded by Rhonda Shrewsbury, uh, specifically to develop affordable housing. Uh, we have a passion for that and want to give back to communities, and this is our way to do that in Bloomington by creating a uh, mixed income, mixed use development right there next to your beautiful new Switchyard Park. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, but yeah. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Ryan and Mr. Crowley for the presentation. Um, we'll now go to council members for any questions that they may have. Um, okay, thank you again for your patience as I flip through screens. Okay, I see none. I will ask again, is there any questions from council members? Seeing none, we will now go to the public um, for public comment on resolution 21-21. And I will ask that you indicate your intent to speak by using the raised hand function in Zoom or send our meeting host a note indicating your um, desire to speak publicly. Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone? We'll give it a, just a second. And I don't, yes. Mr. Allen has a, has a quick note to make uh, about this portion of the meeting. I'm sorry, Michelle, so just, I didn't, just didn't mean to overlook you. I'm sorry. No problem, Mr. President. Uh, I just want to note that this part of the meeting is a public hearing. So anyone that's here to remonstrate or to bring official objections to this, uh, this is your And uh, the public hearing will close at the conclusion of the vote. Thank you. Okay, again, and Mr. I did not see any requests uh, come in while Mr. Allen was giving that explanation. Okay, we'll give it just a few more seconds. And seeing no one wishing to speak from the public, we'll go back to council for final comments on resolution 21-21 um, and or inquiry of our presenters. Okay, again, the council member Sandberg. Well, again, I think it's noteworthy to thank Real America uh, for their uh, collaboration with the city and for the city for um, making this purchase that uh, allows this project to go forward. We all know that affordability and housing is a critical need in this community, and this is a real step forward in that direction uh, in a great location. And we hope this stimulates other opportunities for us to develop affordable housing in partnership with some of these organizations that do such a great job with that. So again, and uh, thank you to um, uh, uh, Real America for the work that will be done. Appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Sandberg. Any further comments from any other council members? Okay, seeing none, are we ready for the question? And seeing no further comments from council, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Sims? Yes. And Flaherty? Yes. Thank you, and that is about at eight zero. Um, I do believe we have more legislation ready for second reading tonight. Council Member Flaherty. Mr. President, I move that resolution 21-22 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you, it's been properly moved and second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Smith. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Rallo? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambalori? I think you called on me, yes. I did. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. And Piedmont Smith? Yes. All right. 
Thank you. Thank you. Will the clerk please read? Yes. Um, resolution 2122, resolution proposing opt out of opioid settlements pursuant to Indiana Code Section 4615.2. The synopsis is as follows. By adopting resolution 2122, the city exercises its option to opt out of a statewide settlements allocation process established by the Indiana Attorney General and codified at Indiana Code 4615 at Secretary. The administration does not believe the proposed Indiana settlement process is in the best interest of the city as it pursues its claims against opioid defendants in the National Opioid Multidistrict Litigation Consolidated in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. This opt-out is permitted under Indiana Code 4615-2. Councilmember Flaherty. Uh, yes, Mr. President, I move that Resolution 21-22 be adopted. Second. Thank you, and properly moved and seconded. Um, Ms. Guthrie, I believe you're here to present. Yes, I am, thank you. Uh, Philippa Guthrie, Corporation Council. Uh, those of you who were on the council in 2018 may remember that we filed a suit um, against opioid defendants uh, in February of 2018. And uh, as mentioned in the synopsis, it was consolidated later, consolidated later in that month with uh, all of the suits that of a similar type by local governments and states um, against opioid defendants in the Northern District of Ohio, and it's called a multi-district litigation. So it's a large action with all of the, the plaintiffs in it against the defendants. Um, <clears throat> during the course of the MDL, there have been ongoing settlement negotiations uh, between plaintiffs and defendants. And recently um, there were, uh, the information came out that there was a national settlement uh, that would have um, resolved all disputes uh, in the offing, but nothing was ever disclosed of a final nature, um, no term sheet or anything. So it's hard to tell if there is such a thing. It doesn't look like there is right now. Uh, there, there obviously are settlement negotiations ongoing, but um, there was no way to confirm that there was anything definitive. During a lot of the, the settlement negotiations over time, uh, in anticipation of a national settlement of that kind, various states had started to work with their local governments uh, on a kind of allocation plan should uh, there be a national settlement and dollars would come to their states and how it would be allocated among the state and the local governments uh, and the plaintiffs. So, um, Indiana didn't really do that. What Indiana did was um, add a provision to the budget bill, House Bill 1001, in this last legislative session. <clears throat> and it, it was done very late in the legislative session, so there was no opportunity really for local governments to participate. There weren't really many conversations, if any, with um, the state. It was the AG's office that was drafting this about how this would look and what the plan would be. And then the uh, new act was adopted. So um, the good news we think, since uh, we don't really like some of the provisions of this act is that they provided a, an opt out. So local governments may opt out of the settlement if they do so by June 30th. Um, that's what we're proposing to do because we don't uh, think that the way that this is structured at this point is um, in the interests of the best interests of the city. A couple of our objections are that um, local governments would not be able to participate in all settlements, and that's primarily because um, if the state hasn't sued um, someone by July 1st, after that point, um, uh, local government would not be able to participate in any um, suits, settlements with plaintiffs who are added after, or defendants who are added after that because the state has sued them. The state will control 85% of all the opioid uh, settlement dollars that would come to Indiana. And that is broken out as follows. 70% would come to the FSSA, 
the um, Family and Social Services Administration, 50% of that 70% um, <clears throat> would go directly from FSSA to the state. The other 50% would go to FSSA itself for allocation among uh, local governments on a regional basis. Uh, there's no description of how that would happen. There's no um, plan uh, in the statute for that, uh, but the FSSA may pass a regulation or several regulations to um, determine how that would work. 15% would go directly to the state, not through FSSA, and 15% would go to local governments based on population. And the population of a county government would be determined um, as the, the population, the aggregate population for all unincorporated areas of the county. <clears throat> Uh, in addition, no new opi opi opioids cases could be instituted by local governments. So um, this would, if, if we were not to opt out, this really removes most of our discretion over our lawsuit. And it could significantly reduce our damages because at this point, at least, Indiana hasn't sued all of the defendants. So and I mentioned earlier that we wouldn't be able to participate in settlements with some defendants, uh, that, could, that could be the case if they don't sue these other defendants. And uh, several of them are quite large and were um, very active in the opioids area. Um, <clears throat> again, there, there are no details on how this would be, this allocation process would work. And um, the state really controls all of those details. And it's not clear that they would consult any of the local governments on crafting this plan since they didn't really consult any of us before they drafted this statute. So um, we would request that you um, approve this resolution, which would allow us to opt out. There is another benefit to the way they drafted that provision, which is that uh, we have 60 days after we have um, opted out to opt back in if things change or we decide we would, we would prefer to opt back in and um, be subject to the statute. So that's uh, the explanation for, for why we recommend opting out and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for presenting Ms. Guthrie. Um, we'll now go to council uh, for any questions for Ms. Guthrie on uh, resolution 21-22. Okay, seeing none from council. Um, I do have one, Ms. Bethany, and I appreciate the opportunity to opt back in within 60 days, I believe you said. Um, what could change between now and then that would lead us to wish to opt back in? Um, is it the clarifications of some of the ambiguities that you mentioned during your um, presentation? Yes, that, that could be a possibility. I, I'm not sure what might change. Uh, I, I would actually, uh, our uh, outside counsel is Cohen and, and Malad in Indianapolis and Jonathan Knoll is on the call. Um, he's in this meeting and um, I would defer to John on that if he has any ideas of what might change between now and 60 days from now. I think he's raised his hand, Stephen. I was muted. Apologies. So there he is. There he there is. Go. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> yes. Good evening. Good evening. It's a pleasure to uh, be with you all and and grateful to work with uh, Philippa and all her team and honored that our uh, firm is able to represent the city of Bloomington in the opioids uh, litigation. Um, you know, at this point, you know, it, we can't predict the future as to what may happen, but it really gives um, uh, the city of Bloomington time to kind of assess where things are um, to see who else has opted out and uh, maybe there can be a opportunity for um, um, a win-win for everyone um, potentially uh, some additional discussions but um, we'll just have to see what happens within 60 days but I guess the the main point that Philip mentioned is there's uh, you know that the city can always opt back in within 60 days if it elects to do so but at least this gives us um, you know, taking the opportunity to take advantage of our right under the statute to uh, 
kind of see where things stand after the June 30th uh, deadline to opt out. Okay, thank you. When you say where things stand, you mean with regard to uh, future possible settlements, um, either as part of the state or as individual? Yeah, I mean, we can see where, where things are at that point. Um, um, with that regard, who else has opted out? Um, things like that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from council? Council member Sandberg. Thank you. Th this is a very simple question and maybe I should know this, but with respect to the settlement, who would we anticipate would apply for uh, or, or file a suit for the settlement? Would, be, would this be individual, uh, an individual or individuals here in this community who could claim harm from um, the opioid industry and would want to file suit to get some of that settlement? And uh, could we predict, um, have, have there been uh, people make, making an effort to file a suit like this in this, in this I, I assume this would only apply to the city of Bloomington, right? Right, the, the statute is, is um applicable to Indiana political subdivisions, so counties, cities, and towns. And the city of Bloomington has filed a lawsuit against various opioid manufacturers, uh, distributors, and also what we call uh, dispenser or pharmacy type defendants. So um, if that answers the question, we're talking about related to the statute talking related to the, to the county. Another, another provision though in the, in the statute is that it bars um, political subdivisions from filing future opioid lawsuits um, the January 1st, um, if, if you stay in the statute. Did, did I answer all your questions? I, wanna, I think there were a couple in there, but I want to make sure I got all of them. Yeah, I, I think so. I'm just, I'm just kind of wanting to identify who would be a beneficiary from successfully filing a lawsuit here from our area. Uh, again, I, I would assume there would be several people who could make the claim that they were victims here. Right. So the lawsuit is, is, is just on behalf of the city of the city for to try to seeking damages caused by the opioid crisis and not only reimbursement, but, um, you know, damages to, to help uh, uh, recover and funds to help abate the problem going forward. I see that helps because it's not an individual person who has been harmed from their addiction. It is actually the city itself. That clarifies that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Councilmember Clarity. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation and, and for taking our questions. My, my only question in reading um, the resolution was sort of, uh, it seems like your analysis is that we, it, it, it's much more likely that we'll be better off as a, in a better position as a city um, to, to opt out. Um, what, what are the potential downsides there, uh, whether it's, you know, staff time or legal expense to stay involved in this actively as opposed to the state? you know, opting into the state uh, approach on this. And, and we feel like, obviously the administration feels like it's in our interest to do so, but could you talk through a little bit about um, kind of those trade-offs as well as, um, yeah, what, what, what our participation will look like going forward as a city uh, who's a party to the suit, given that we're opting out of the, of the state settlement structure? Sure, so uh, assuming the city does not elect to opt back in within 60 days, um, the case, the it, it's claims to go forward in the court system. Right now, as Philip has said, they, all of the cases filed in federal court are consolidated before one judge in the uh, Northern District of Ohio. Um, there have been some cases that are being actively worked up for trial, and there's um, um, other cases across the country currently in trial. Um, so Bloomington's case has uh, not been selected as one of those for one of those early trials, which are called bellwether trials. Bellwether trials are typically allow parties to kind of test legal theories and um, um, and strengths and weaknesses of the case um, to potentially promote a global resolution, um, so that the case would just remain pending um, in, in Ohio if, if things go forward um, and the state is not out back in. Versus, if you if you opt out, you are ceding control, as Philip mentioned, to um, to the state regarding the, the framework for distribution of settlement funds. Thank you, and, and we feel like there's a good chance that by um, opting out, we'll have um, potentially more control and or uh, uh, a larger or different share of, of a portion of a settlement. Is that 
kind of the gist well, of it. Yeah, I can't predict the future or any dollar figures of any potential settlements. Um, but but certainly, you know, the, the state of Bloomington by by opting out continues to make it take control over its its claims and its claims would get, would uh, continue uh, going forward. Uh, just one more small follow up, if it's okay, sure, uh, Mr. Sure. Sims, uh, yes. which is which is just the the converse of that, which is that we don't we think it's unlikely that we will find ourselves in a worse off position <laughs> by by opting out uh, from whatever position we would have been in uh, had we in, taken taken part in the state approach. Is that is that right? Um, I can rephrase. I mean, well, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> or go. No, um, I'm just really making sure that we're doing our diligence as a council here to make sure, sure. that um, we've thought through the potential uh, risk of, of us being left worse off by by taking this approach, so that's all. Yeah, no, and I think, look, that, that's certainly a valid concern. And look, at this point, it really is just an administrative step to exercise the option it has to opt out because then it can always opt back in depending on where things stand. You know, where, you know, we see where things stand after July 1st after the statute gets en enacted. And that can be for, uh, facilitate further discussions at that time, um, you know, if the city if the city wants to opt back in. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Flaherty. Do we have any further questions from any um, other council members? Okay, seeing none, we'll now go to the public for public comment. I will ask you again to indicate your intentions to speak publicly by using the raised hand function in Zoom and or sending our meeting post a note in chat um, indicating your desire to speak publicly. Do we have any takers, Mr. Lucas, that you can see? No, I don't believe so. Okay, give it just another second. Seeing no one from the public, we'll go back to council for final comments, um, if anyone has any. Okay, council member Piedmont Smith. Yeah, I mean, uh, as a lay person, I, I, it seems like a good idea to me to keep our options open by opting out at this point. Um, I, uh, I assume that um, our further legal expenses in retaining counsel and our own staff time will more than be compensated when we do get settlement funds. So uh, look forward to that happening. Thank you. Thank you. Any other final comments from council members? Okay. Um, are you ready for the question and see no further comments from council members? Will the clerk please call the roll on resolution 21 22? Councilmember Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Yvonne Smith? Yes. And Smith? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Resolution 21-22 is adopted 8-0. Uh, we do have further second readings this evening. Council Member Flaherty. Yes, Mr. President, I move that resolution 21-23 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you, it's been properly moved to second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Councilmember Rallo. Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Sandberg? Yes. Thank you. Will the clerk please read? Yes. 
Resolution 2123, recognizing the 52nd anniversary of the Stonewall Riots and the June celebration of Pride Month. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution is sponsored by Council Members Scambaluri and Council Member Flaherty. It recognizes the substantial contributions of members of the LGBTQ plus community in our community and beyond. Further, it remembers the 1969 protests at the Stonewall End as a significant moment in the struggle for equality for the LGBTQ plus community. And it reaffirms the City of Bloomington's commitment to supporting the rights, freedoms, and equal treatment of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and other sexual and gender minority individuals. Thank you. Councilmember Flaherty. Move that resolution 21-23 be adopted. Second. Thank you, it's been properly moved and second. Who do we have presenting this evening? Um, is that the sponsors or the clerk? Me. That's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not on the screen you are, so we'll say no. No, sorry. But if I'm not on the right screen, honestly. Go ahead, so. Council Member Scambler. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and thank you, everyone. Um, I especially want to acknowledge my co-sponsors, uh, Council Member Flaherty and also Council Member Sandberg, uh, whose name didn't appear in an earlier version, but I, I wish to thank them for joining me in sponsoring this, uh, this uh, resolution that initially came to us at the invitation of the Indiana Stonewall Democrats. Um, June 28th marks the 52nd anniversary of the Stonewall riots in New York City. Um, and as Clerk Bolden read, that is pretty widely regarded as a very pivotal moment um, in the move for, toward civil rights for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, queer, and other gender minorities. And Bloomington is a city that has over and over again reminded uh, and underscored its values of commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion. Uh, and this resolution is in many ways just a very logical extension of that. So um, we would appreciate your support and your consideration. Um, I would invite co-sponsors, um, council members Flaherty and Sandberg to add any thoughts they may have. Um, Uh, yes, uh, just briefly, um, I think I would echo I'm the sorry. sentiments of... Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Council Member Flaherty. Buddy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, there was sort of a long pause, so I just went for it. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, no, just wanted to echo the sentiments uh, shared by Council Member Scambolari and thank the Stonewall Democrats of South Central Indiana uh, for bringing this to us. I think um, the, the resolution very much speaks for itself and in and, and, uh, recognizing... Um, uh, the harm is visited on the LGBTQ plus community um, in this nation, in this state, in this community, uh, and yet honors the, the many, many contributions and, and reaffirms um, Bloomington's commitment to, to equity and inclusion uh, for all. So uh, happy to co-sponsor and, and um, uh, take any questions from council members as well. Thank you, council member Sandberg. Yes, and again, uh, grateful to be a co-sponsor. This is just one of many steps that the city of Bloomington has taken to show our commitment to the members of our community who certainly have suffered um, at the hands of discrimination and are um, you know, certainly deserving of all the civil rights that we can muster. This is um, one of many things that the city of Bloomington has done with respect to this community that we are uh, grateful for, uh, for their many contributions and and uh, so I'm sure uh, the rest of council would also join us in support uh, for this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Sandberg. Um, we'll now go to council members for any questions. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll now go to the public for any public comment on resolution 21-23. Uh, please indicate your intent to speak by utilizing the raised hand function in Zoom and or sending our meeting posts a note in chat um, indicating your desire to speak publicly. Uh, Mr. Lucas, we have any takers? I see one. Yes, Jim Shelton, who should be able to unmute. Good evening again, Castle. Uh, 
my wife of 52 and a half years and I uh, enthusiastically endorse this and encourage you to approve it. We have so many gay friends and uh, they do really make a large contribution to our community. So I think, uh, you know, I agree with everything the sponsors have said and encourage you to approve this. And I'm really sorry we even have to think about it or talk about it anymore. But since we do, I strongly endorse it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Do we have any further comments, Mr. Lucas? I don't see any at the moment, no. Okay, thank you very much. We will now go back to council for any final comments on resolution 21-23. Okay, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, I'd like to thank the Stonewall Democrats for uh, bringing this forward and my three council colleagues for co sponsoring. Um, I think uh, this is a great resolution just to reaffirm our commitment to respect every human being, and that respect includes respecting who they choose to love, who they choose to interact with, how they choose to identify. Um, it's all just a matter of respecting a, each person the way he or she or they are. And I think that's fundamental and it can never be stated strongly enough. So thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Uh, Clerk Bowden. Um, forgive me for not saying this earlier, but. Um, <clears throat> As a member of the executive board of the Stonewall Democrats, I'd like to thank the council for bringing this resolution this evening. So thank you all. Thank you. And thank you to our sponsor for bringing it on their behalf. Um, do we have any other comments from council members? Was that your hand, council member Rosenberger? No, okay. Um, seeing that, I'll make a final comment. Um, I too want to thank um, the Stonewall Democrats and my colleagues for bringing this forward. Um, I think this is important that we in the city um, do resolutions such as this that we, such as we did for um, uh, condemning and um, renouncing white supremacy. Um, uh, many others that we've done and that we will continue to do as we move forward. Um, I was particularly taken aback or not taken aback, but I'm interested in reading the last whereas clause. Um, and it specifically says the inclusion of LGBTQ plus people in Bloomington continues to expand and LGBTQ plus people in Bloomington remain determined to pursue equity, equality, respect and inclusion for all individuals regardless of sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, this is an important resolution and why I think that particular whereas clause is very important to me is because it focuses on uh, some of the commonalities that we have as a community. Um, and we understand the differences and we try to recognize those and, and work on um, equity and, and fairness and inclusion. Um, but I think it's important to also recognize what Many of these groups, the marginalized groups, um, those that are less fortunate in this community, those that suffer discrimination and other inequitable um, situations, I think it's important that we identify what we have in common. Um, and that is the pursuit of equality, respect and inclusion for everyone. Um, and on behalf of this um, resolution, recognizing the 52nd anniversary of the Stonewall Riots and the June celebration of Pride Month. I am very happy to support this. Um, do we have any other comments from council? Okay, are we ready for the question? And seeing no further comment from council, will the clerk please call the roll on, I'm sorry, resolution 21-23. Council member Rosenberger. Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? 
Yes. Dean Mount Smith. Yes. Smith. Yeah. Sandberg. Yes. Rallo. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Resolution 21-23 is adopted 8-0. Uh, we do have more legislation ready for second reading tonight. Council Member Flaherty. President, I move that ordinance 21-30 um, be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you, it's been properly moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Scambaluri. Yes. Sims. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. And Rosenberger? Yes. Great. Thank you. That um, passes 9 0. Council Member Flaherty? I believe we need the clerk to read and then be ready. I do, uh, I'm so sorry. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2130 to amend Title 16 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Residential Rental Unit and Lodging Establishment Inspecting Program. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends Title 16 Residential Rental Unit and Lodging Establishment Inspection Program by requiring annual submittal of an occupancy affidavit for certain types of residential rental units and providing for notices of violation to be deemed properly served if transmitted by email to the owner email address registered with hand on the form described in Bloomington Municipal Code, section 1603020. Your, committee house, your housing committee recommendation was due pass 400, and you had a due pass recommendation for Amendment 1 of 900, Amendment 2 of 540, and you had a motion to postpone to tonight of 900. Thank you very much. Council Member Flaherty. Uh, I move that Ordinance 21-30 be adopted. Second. I, I actually had a point of order as well. That's why I was yeah. momentarily yes. confused. No, go ahead. Um, I'm struggling to remember offhand. Uh, I believe the clerk just mentioned that uh, Amendments 1 and 2 uh, had due pass recommendations. But I, I, I seem to recall that that happened at second reading. Um, and, and as such, the Amendments 1 and 2 uh, would have been um, uh, adopted or not, as opposed to a recommendation. Is that? Yeah, my apologies. Those were adopted. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you. That's it uh, for that. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, is Mr. Zodi presenting? Um, Mr. President, with the consent of the council, I have a quick PowerPoint presentation I'd like to do just to update you on changes that have come about that we're recommending for tonight's uh, consideration. Duly noted, please proceed. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, All right. Point of order. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Council Member Flaherty. If, if uh, just a suggestion, perhaps that um, uh, if, if these are uh, regarding uh, the proposed amendment uh, three, perhaps it would make sense for a sponsor of that amendment to introduce it and then, and then move forward with the presentation. Uh, describing the amendment, which is what it sounded like may be the case. Yes, these, uh, my presentation is reflective of the changes in the amendment. So uh, I'll defer to council on that. Okay, I will respectfully ask you to clear the screen. Sure, here we go. Thank you. Um, let me get to the next amendment, sorry. That's it. <clears throat> Okay, um, and we have Amendment 3, and do we have a fourth amendment as well? Yes, there's a... I'm a sorry, I'm, think, I'm thinking out loud. So, okay, um, we do have Amendment 3. Okay, um, submitted by Council Member Sam Smith and Rollo at the request of Hand Department. We should just consider okay. a motion to uh, adopt Amendment 3. Sorry. 
No, no, you're absolutely right. I'm just waiting on my parliamentarian to lead me down the road. So. Oh, I was, I could make the motion, but I was uh, leaving it to a, a, no. a co-sponsor of the amendment was all, sorry. I'd like to make a motion for... to uh, take up uh, and pass amendment three. Second. Thank you, it's been properly moved and second. Um, uh, Council Member Smith or Rollo, would either one of you care to um, present amendment three? Uh, I, I can make a brief introductory comment that um, uh, wanted, there were some changes uh, in uh, issues that we were thinking about from the council and we had questions. There was some public comment and there was some comment from um, business members in the community related to the, the rental affidavits. And uh, Mr. Zodi has um, done an excellent job of reflecting those in the amendment. And um, anything else, Mr. Rollo? Uh, no, I don't have anything. I suggest that we uh, proceed to Mr. Zodi. Thank you. Okay, thank you for being one of the sponsors. I don't have anything else to add at this time as well. Um, before we proceed, uh, Council Member Flaherty, is there any actions on this amendment before we go to presentations? Uh, no, I believe uh, since Mr. Zodi's presentation would, would address this amendment, uh, we, could, we could hear that before considering questions, comment, et cetera, on the amendment. Okay, thank you. Um, in the same vein, should we hear amendment four likewise? Uh, I, no, because the amendment four, uh, which, which I'm the sponsor of, is conditional on amendment three passing. So I think uh, we can consider that in due course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Zodi, if you are ready, you can take over the screen and present, please. Thank you. Can everyone see the screen and hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Well, I want to thank the council for their um, guidance and uh, diligence on this issue. I, you've, uh, it's been before you uh, four times now in a public forum, I believe, and uh, we are glad to have uh, sought the input of different folks around the community over the last couple of weeks since the June 2nd hearing. So I'm going to take you through just I've got four slides with substance on here. So it'll be pretty quick because um, I have talked to or reached out to all nine of you at one point or another to kind of tell you what's going on here. And I want to make sure the public's able to see that as well. Um, especially those who I might have reached out to or our department has reached out to and make sure that this input is reflective of their, uh, their suggestions. So the goal, just to restate the goal of what the occupancy affidavit uh, would do for the city, um, it uh, really serves a, a, as a basis by which the staff at the city, particularly hand, can track occupancy and rental units. Uh, it also will assist in the data collection and puts in place a, a basic standard by which occupancy would be tracked for a certain specific universe of rental units. So uh, right now we sort of uh, assume people are complying with the ordinance. Uh, there are records on file, uh, but nothing um, necessarily provided by the city. We're no longer required, as I'll say below, to, to uh, allow, uh, to require the uh, tenants' rights or responsibilities document. So this affidavit um, modeled, of course, uh, the concept modeled after the city of West Lafayette uh, would put that standard in place. Um, it would also, on the, on the other side of the coin, if I may, would uh, be to provide documentation from both property owners and tenants that they both understand the occupancy ordinance and provide an attestation that they are complying with it. So uh, to reflect the council's concern of, of making sure that there is that education component there that everyone is aware. And if I may, I uh, hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but uh, landlords, uh, like to have their tenants educated as well. So if I may, this could benefit that. I won't speak uh, for them, but I do believe that the more information, the better uh, here. And so uh, because we're no longer to require that rights or responsibilities uh, document, this could, this could serve that purpose uh, from our perspective. Um, so the changes from the original proposal that, that, you'll, that you see in Amendment 3 uh, really relate to uh, three areas, privacy, process, and legal changes, which I'll uh, ask Daniel Dixon from our legal department to kind of tee up here because uh, he might be able to explain some of those a little better than me. But the privacy issue was a big one when I reached out to renters, uh, and that effort is 
uh, not a, you know, there isn't currently an organization that represents renters. I reached out to some uh, from a group that are kind of gathering renters and I'll be again, careful about how I characterize those conversations because I don't want to speak for them, but did my best to reach out to people I had, comment, had commented on social media or that I heard from or that I thought just kind of did some basic outreach there. And privacy was a big issue. Uh, and I, I think that's valid. So we have suggested removing the contact information and the issue of uh, what determines a familial relationship from the ordinance itself and of the affidavit form. Um, also, while the ordinance would require the form to be presented at inspections or at the request of the hand department, it would otherwise stay with the landlord or property manager in their files, uh, rather than it be, be submitted to the hand department. If it were submitted to the department, it's subject to public records requests, uh, which we don't want to compromise the confidentiality of any tenants uh, on a general scale. So if we have to request one for an over-occupancy investigation or if a inspector requested one at the inspection and it wasn't provided, the uh, landlord or, or property manager would need to send it in later. In that case, we would have affidavits on file at the office, but not in mass. Uh, and so we feel that respects the privacy issue a little better. As far as process goes, uh, in, in addition to the where it's housed uh, with the landlords and property managers rather than at hand, we also removed the uh, timing window of September as the completion period for the affidavit, which allows more flexibility for the tenants and property managers lease cycles. We don't have the authority to enforce what the term of a lease is, so we, we understand and respect that people sign those in different ways at different times, and we think that is reflective of those concerns as well. Um, the legal concerns, uh, we removed the language on the original form uh, there was a language or there was language concerning perjury and we've taken that out and tied the issue of a violation back to the city code, uh, which is we feel is more appropriate as it relates to uh, Title 16 and, and since this is a city ordinance. Uh, we removed email as a means of legal notifications. We heard a lot about that from the legal community about uh, the reliance of or lack thereof if an email goes to spam and there was a legal notification there it could jeopardize the timing on things like that and so we've removed that from the ordinance and daniel this is where i'll need you to kind of chime in if counselors have questions of course but clarify diligent inquiry to reasonable inquiry to uh, sort of better and explain the issue of intent so um you know, kind of what was the intent if there was if there was a mistake or if the form wasn't filled out it just speaks a little better to uh, the intent uh, of the form and uh, may ask Daniel to just chime in here to explain that. So we feel overall that uh, these changes reflect the input we've sought and received and they strike a balance. I think this is important that uh, with all of the factors considered here in our city, we think it strikes the balance of protecting the, con or protecting the privacy of tenants, addressing the concerns of our neighborhoods and respecting the varied uh, nature of rental property management in Bloomington with the uh, different systems they use and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, and then we still believe that these changes will uh, allow us to meet the goal that we would like with the occupancy affidavit in the first place. The last thing I'll say is that on the form that is in your packet, um, there's a just a typo, we should have changed the word submit to complete and maintain to make sure it matches with the ordinance changes and that just wanted to make sure that was noted in case any of you had looked at the affidavit form and had that question. It would not be submitted. It would be maintained and completed, uh, as I mentioned, with the landlord. So uh, that's my presentation. Uh, happy to answer any questions. I will, I might, Mr. President, if it's okay to ask Daniel Dixon to uh, fill in any legal uh, things I left out and uh, want to thank the hand staff. Our assistant director, Brent Pierce, is on and our program manager, uh, John Hewitt, is as well, and want to thank them for their help and guidance here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would like him to be available if there's any questions from council with regard to um, legalities. Um, do we have any questions from council members? Okay. Um, thank you for your patience. I keep scrolling through the council member Rosenbarger. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Zodi, for that updated presentation. It's really helpful to see the changes like that in real time. Can you talk a little bit about um, the process as it is right now for how you um, deal with over-occupancy complaints 
and um, so it's what we do right now. And then a different question, like the data that show this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Sure, if I, if I follow you correctly, Council Member Rosenberger. Um, you know, as I as I mentioned, that the feedback to the office um, comes in different ways. So we'll get a call, uh, we'll get a U report, um, we'll get an email. An inspector may see something on uh, when they're out doing a other an, an inspection for another reason, like a cycle inspection. And so um, it's my understanding, and I know all of you know I haven't been here that long, so I'm not going to profess to know the uh, long term history uh, here. But from what I've gathered and what I know. Um, the, so the complaints come in different ways. I know that myself because I've gotten a couple of them since I've come to the city. Um, so they will come in in different ways. And the way we respond to that, just like anything else, is we'll dig into it and, you know, we'll check what information we have on that rental unit. You know, what's the cycle? Uh, what's the history of the unit? We have large property files in the office, as you know. Um, if we had a rights and responsibilities form that we could still require, for instance, we would uh, check that, for instance, to see what tenants are on there and just sort of go over the information and look toward um, the issue of over occupancy. There's also has, has been an interview uh, form in the past where the, the inspector can interview the tenant, interview the tenants and the landlord and go through a process of investigating over in, or, uh, over occupancy uh, allegations. The affidavit would serve as a tool to immediately go back and say, okay, we need to see your affidavit rather than going through all the information and sort of looking back through the history. There's only so far you can go back that provides valuable information. If this is updated annually, you're going to have a list of tenants. You're going to have the owner who have signed attesting to the fact that they currently understand and are complying by the ordinance. And that is the documentation that can be requested uh, that legal documentation that can start help start the process for an investigation that would uh, be started probably by uh, hand. Uh, complaints or concerns come into the planning and transportation department as well, and they have uh, an enforcement officer uh, planner there that that does works on code violations. So it's varied the way it starts, and we want to say that we don't. They're not always. You know, I got a call. I think I told this story uh, to some of you before. I got a call. A couple of weeks ago about a unit that some neighbors were concerned was going to be um, uh, or a house was going to be uh, over occupied because it had been an owner occupied home and that it was going to be a rental and it was being sold and we made some phone calls talked to the the owner and were comfortable that they fully understood the ordinance and were complying by it and saw that on the listing so that didn't go any farther so what we need is because it's so varied we need a standard uh something in place that we can go back and reference uh that shows from a legal perspective who's on the lease who is the list who is listed as a tenant and who the landlord is and that they all understand the process 